What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Post Position Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jack Duffy. With me today is Jack Connell. What's going on, man? Nothing much, you know. It's a it's a crazy four days in the NBA. I mean, it's from the, right after the Super Bowl to the trade deadline. As always, hectic. You're going to start seeing some moves going. So I'm really started, excited to get into it. I got a whole list of guys and teams to talk about. So I'm really excited. Oh, yeah, it's almost that time for those 3 a.m. Tobias Harris, Clippers, the Sixers trade. So a um, whole lot going on in the next few days. So basically, this podcast is going to be a trade deadline primer. We're going to go through basically trades you think that are going to happen with contenders, and then we're going to go through individual players as well. And then we'll also get into the whole New York Knicks fiasco with them firing their president of basketball operations, and then we'll get into some more trade deadline stuff. So let's get into it. <laughs> What's going on, guys? Post Position Podcast. This is your trade deadline primer. I'm your co-host, Jack Duffy. You can follow me at Twitter at JackDuffyTPL. I am a beat writer for the Penny Lions covering the Charlotte Hornets and Greensboro Swarm. And with me is my co-host, Jack Connell. You can find him on Twitter at JackConnellTPL. He does Sixers, Eagles, and tons of college, high school, all that kind of stuff for TPL. So get into some trade deadline stuff. So, uh, Jack, what are your initial thoughts on the trade deadline? Do you think it's going to be hectic like last year? Do you think it's going to be a little bit more dead? I think it's going to be a, I think there's going to be a decent amount of moves, but they're not going to be high level moves. For people that are going to be following basketball kind of closely, they'll see it as important moves because you're going to see a lot of inter- integral role players kind of making moves to teams that are going to help build contenders or maybe you're going to see contenders miss out on guys that are kind of maybe stunt their season a little bit. But to the casual fan, they're really not going to care. They're going to be like, who is like Davis Bertans? Why do I care that he's getting traded? I don't, there's not going to be, I think the biggest name you see possibly get moved is Quinn Capella. I really don't think it'll be a deadline surrounded by stars. I don't, this is going to be a role player heavy. Deadline. Yeah. I'm right there with you. I think just with this free agency class in 2020, it's pretty weak. So Teams aren't going to be trying to clear up their cap space or get below the luxury tax this summer for free agents during the free agency deadline, uh, trade deadline. So I think it's not going to be too active. I think there's potential for a few big name players to get traded, but none of that has been legitimately reported yet. So I think, like you said, it's going to be a lot of little, um, it's going to be a lot of role players getting traded. And uh, yeah, I think just uh, contenders that are already here competing for or boosting their team for the finals so uh, I think one of the first teams that we can both talk about we're both Philly guys let's talk about the Sixers so Jack what do you think is the biggest move the Sixers need to make at the trade deadline I am thinking you're gonna see I think it's gonna be Bogdan Bogdanovich or Robert Covington Covington I don't know we're kind of seeing reports as of this is where this is Tuesday at about five o'clock in the evening the latest we have heard is there's a three or four team trade going on with Covington possibly going to Houston. We'll talk about this more later, but this takes kind of Philadelphia's kind of top targets in, so far in trade deadline as of right now is kind of Bogdan Bogdanovich, Robert Covington, Alec Burks have kind of been the three that they have been rumored around. So I think Covington kind of taking out Chase. I like Bogdanovich, but Sacramento really doesn't seem keen to move him. So I don't know. He's a, It's an interesting guy. Really first I was out on him, and then I kind of looked at a situation where I realized he's a restricted free agent. So the ability to retain him or sign him and flip him. So I am intrigued in him. I like him. I think he's a good fit in Philly. I think those are kind of the two guys. We see Derek Rose kind of linked. But the Detroit's asking price is very high. I don't know if they're going to take him and move him. I don't know. They're asking for a lottery pick. Philadelphia does not he's have not a, a lottery He's not a lottery pick, pick worthy at all. Him or any of the other guys are asking for. Yeah, I don't think he's somebody – I mean – and Gary Harris has been made available in talks. Philadelphia hasn't been linked to him. He's an interesting person to throw into talks. Those are kind of the guys. Kennard seems like he's going to be headed to Phoenix as of right now. He's really somebody loosely linked to Philadelphia. That'd be a solid fit. I don't think he's going to land there. Davis Bertans is another. I don't know. So, I mean, there's a lot of players that are linked to Philadelphia, and there's no real strong connection just yet. 
Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, in my opinion, I think the Sixers are the most desperate team. I think even more so than the Rockets right now uh, as the tread deadline approaches. I mean, they just – I mean, structurally right now, this team doesn't work. They need another pick-and-roll ball handler, like you said, Derrick Rose. I think Langston Gow would be an also a great fit. He's a sharpshooter as well. that can shoot off the dribble. That would fit right in next to Ben Simmons and Josh Richardson. And then they just need shooting. They need pick-and-roll ball handling and shooting. And I think those are the two biggest needs right now. And any deal the Sixers have, you're going to throw Mike Scott in there. I think Zaire Smith is definitely – just being uh, showcased right now just for him to be traded first round pick last year. We know the whole peanut allergy thing happened. Um, so I think those two would definitely be in picks. Jonah Bolden as well. I think those are the two biggest guys. Cause I mean, at backup point guard right now, we've seen Rollo Nato and uh, Trey Burke not be the answers. And in the playoff season, I don't think those guys defensively can stay on the floor. And what we've seen recently is Mike Scott and Rollo Nito get an increase in playing time. The guess on that is it's the reason why they're getting so much playing time over guys like James Ennis is that teams, they're basically showcasing those two guys for teams coming into the trade deadline that those guys are a bit more worthy than they actually are uh, in reality that they're playing on a playoff team right now. So I think as of right now, those two guys will definitely be in along with Zaire Smith, uh, maybe Jonah Bolden. Any other thoughts on the Sixers? Well, I do. I can say for a fact the 76ers are shopping Mike Scott. I do know that they are trying to move him in his contract. I think, you, like we talked about, the likely package they're kind of throwing at teams is Zaire Smith, Mike Scott, and some sort. They have some pretty high second rounders you could kind of almost call for a draft picks this year. Now, the draft isn't really as deep as it was last year, so I don't know how much teams are interested in those picks. But, I mean, they do have – be a, a, a sort of a package to throw teams. I don't know what that will land them as teams get desperate and what moves are made because you do have a lot of these guys that Philadelphia are linked with are also linked with Los An- the Lakers, the Clippers, Milwaukee. So, I mean, they have competition, these guys they want to try to bring in. So I don't know if what they have is enough to bring in who they would want the pick of the litter. I think they might just get whoever's left. Another team I want to talk about that that's not getting a lot of attention near the trade deadline that I think is honestly the most intriguing team coming up to Thursday's deadline is the Denver Nuggets. So there's a bunch of different ways the Nuggets can go. I think if you look at their roster right now, that they have a bunch of guys that are on expiring contracts this year. You have Juancho Hernan Gomez, who's not really in the rotation. Torrey Craig, Malik Beasley, and Mason Plumley are all going to be impending free agents this summer so i think if you're the nuggets this is kind of your year to win and there's a few different routes i personally think they can go um obviously gary harris has been brought up in trade conversations he's making 19.1 million dollars next year and then 20.8 in 2021 and then also jeremy grant who's a nice little cat filler there um who has a um, player option for 9.34 million dollars next year uh, when you think about Gary Harris, that's also linked to Drew Holiday. So, I mean, if you're the Pelicans, if you can trade Drew Holiday, which I don't think they will, but one thing that David Griffin has said at years past is no player is untradeable. So if you're the Pelicans and you can trade Gary Harris for – or trade Drew Holiday for Gary Harris and also get picks in return to maybe some young talent, I think you definitely do that. Um, but also another thing you could think about as well is Denver – uh, could be linked to Kevin Love as well. The Millsap and Love money works straight up, and you can throw Denver picks in there as well. But you might need a third team to get Gary Harris out of there with the salary that I mentioned before. Um, and they also have an Oklahoma City first-round pick this year. It's top 10 protected, but you don't see the Thunder finishing the bottom 10 in the NBA. So I think the Nuggets this year, I mean, if you're Drew Holiday, uh, you're on a team right now the Pelicans that are outside the playoffs right now and you go to the Nuggets, that'd be a great fit alongside Nikola Jokic, Jamal Murray, Michael Porter Jr. and all those other guys. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. I think Denver sees himself as a team that can make a championship push this year. I mean, like you said, I think that'd be a right move. Currently, they're third place in the West. They're four games out of first. New Orleans, they are five games out of the eighth seed. I don't, with a team like Portland, who's kind of making a push, it seems like the West is kind of starting to settle itself as it's eight. I would love Memphis, but I just they have the second hardest schedule remaining. So I do think you're going to see Portland kind of take that seat. I don't think you're going to see New Orleans kind of land a playoff spot now. They aren't really looking to contend. They're kind of building their young core. Like you see Lonzo, Brandon Ingram, Zion, Jackson Hayes, Alexander Walker. They have a really great group of young guys. And I think getting more picks, flipping some of the talent they have for capital, because they really aren't going to be contending using their pick to get better this year. I do think you could see Drew Holiday possibly getting moved. David Griffin, he's a great GM. I do think you might see a move there. I think you said Denver. I really do think they'll make some kind of move there. I think Drew Holiday would be a great fit for them. 
Kevin Love. I I know you were talking about that from earlier. They're very interesting. I mean, not, that I think it'd be a very interesting move. We haven't heard anything about that. Salary would be interesting to see flipping Paul Millsap. I think that would be interesting. Denver could go a couple ways. They're a very sneaky, interesting team to watch here. I mean, and even if they stay pat, I mean, the team they have is very, very solid. Jamal Murray, Nikola Jokic, Millsap, even if he were to say, it's a very solid group of guys. Michael Porter Jr. is going to be a great player in this league when he gets older. So I do think they could go a couple ways. It's really be interesting to see. I think New Orleans, you'll see as sellers of the deadline and Denver, more buyers. Kind of going back to that Kevin Love trade, one thing that's really interesting about the Cavs in a potential trade with Kevin Love and Paul Millsap is Millsap's deal is expiring this year. So that's one thing that Cavs would like to have is trade out that Kevin Love contract that's really bad. And Kevin Love has done literally everything he can except for literally post on social media saying, like, I want to be traded. He's gotten mad at the front office, coaches, teammates. He kind of settled down a little bit more, I think, because – uh, him being so adamant that he wanted to be traded would kind of hurt his value a few months back when he was slapping benches uh, during games and uh, yelling at his teammates. And also the things that the Cavs also have is they have two open roster spots. So if there's potentially a three-team trade with Gary Harris, you could also use the Cavs as a salary dump destination in a Kevin Love trade. So you could send Gary Harris to a third team. You could send Paul Millsap to Cleveland, Kevin Love to Denver. This, By the way, this has not been reported, but this is just me spitballing. Um I mean, right, like we said before, Denver's one of those teams this year that you think they could, if they add one more piece, they could definitely be a contender in the West for the actual finals. Um, I mean, they're, I think they're worse than their record indicates this year. I mean, Jokic had a slow start to the season. Uh, Jamal Murray's inconsistent like he always is. Michael Porter's finally starting to play a little bit better. But they definitely have some spots on their team. They definitely have some holes in their team in certain places. So, And I think Gary Harris has definitely kind of fallen out. He's kind of fell off a cliff the last few years. Uh, and then Jeremy Grant's kind of had inconsistent minutes off the bench. So I think if the Nuggets could go and go get Drew Holiday to put alongside Jamal Murray, that'd be great, uh, a lockdown guy at the two spot. Um, Drew, Drew Holiday likes playing the two better than the one, but he could also share the ball handling responsibilities with Jamal Murray. And then you also have Jokic down low. I mean, that, I think that would be definitely a contender in the West. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think Drew Holiday would absolutely change that team in Denver. Really, they are. I mean, they many casual fans really. I mean, they're kind of starting to realize, but they don't realize that Denver's a very good team. Denver really hasn't been much of the spotlight since the Mellow days in terms of national media, and I'm a lot. I mean, every real great NBA fan knows that they are a good team. It's just they. I think this will kind of start to make everybody realize, wow, like they can win. Like you said, I mean, they're one move away. I think from having a legitimate chance of making the finals. Um, I think another team we can also think about, actually, before we talk about another team, let's talk about Andre Iguodala because he's also linked to a bunch of different contenders out in the West and also in the East. Um, We saw last night that the whole John Morant and Dylan Brooks thing on Instagram and Twitter and then Steph Curry, that whole big ordeal that happened last night. Uh, Andre Iguodala says if he's not traded to one of the teams he wants to get traded to, by the deadline, um, then he's going to sit out the rest of the year, and that obviously doesn't settle well with his teammates. What are your kind of thoughts on that whole entire thing? That was incredible. I was, I woke up to that, and I was like, what is going on? Like, I'm seeing, like, John Morant taking shots at Steph Curry. Like, oh, my goodness, shit, tweeting pictures of Kevin Durant with titles. I thought that was – I love the beef. I love this rivalry, and I love it. I do think Iguodala, I mean, it's kind of – his team, like, like I kind of mentioned, they had the second harsh main schedule, but they are an eight seed, and they are a very interesting team. Jaron Jackson Jr., Alan Shunas, John Morant, Jay Crowder, like, they have a squad. Like they are a very, they are a very solid low seed team. Granted, I know Iguodala, he's had his success. He doesn't need to do it. He wants to win a championship. He's gotten his money. He's gotten his Finals MVP. He's been a part of the Warriors dynasty. So I, I do think it's a little bit, kind of. I mean, it, I do think it's a bit unfair to Memphis that. He is just sitting out like this. Granted, they kind of traded him to take on as a salary dump. But, I mean, if this was a team like Atlanta or something, I would get it. But, I mean, this is a near playoff contender. I think it's kind of ridiculous to only sit out for a championship contender. I mean, I think he is going to get moved because I think by the end of the trade deadline, teams are going to get desperate. I think, personally, um, the biggest team with the biggest chance to get Andre Godala is the Dallas Mavericks. I think they throw in Court- Courtney Lee to make money work and then a second round pick. Uh, but another team as well that could uh, figure their way into this is also the Los Angeles Clippers. They also want 
uh, depth on the wing. Mo Harkless really hasn't fit in well with this team right now. And you could throw in Mo Harkless for salaries, uh, J. Michael Green, and then a second round pick as well. The Clippers do have, I think this is their last, I have a 2020 first round pick, which is literally their last first round pick for God knows how long. I think literally seven years uh, with that whole Oklahoma City trade for Paul George last year. So I think Iggy could definitely go to the Clippers or the Mavericks as their two playoff teams. I have heard that the Clippers, I mean, it's the Clippers and the Lakers have been surrounding Iggy Dahl for a while. I do know they want him badly. I mean, it's kind of obvious. It's just, it's a matter of time, I think. It's going to be, in my opinion, I think it'll be the Lakers or the Clippers. One of them will make a move for him. I think that is going to be where he'll end up. He'll end up in Los Angeles, one way or the other. doesn't matter which. It's been linked all year that he's bound for an L.A. team. Um, I think on that Clippers team right now, you had Andre Godala, and one other thing that the Clippers also – really need is they need a center. They're kind of worried about their inside presence because you see when, I mean, Zubach isn't, I mean, if they went into a playoff series right now, they're worried to go against a team like Utah with Rigo Bear or Denver with Nikola Jokic. And Zubach, he has great pick and roll chemistry right now with Kawhi Leonard, so they might not want to trade him. But you see when Montrose Harrell is on the floor at the five, they're being out-rebounded by a tremendous amount. So, I mean, I think if the Clippers want an inside presence as well, getting a center, that would be one thing they can look into. Um, maybe Tristan Thompson, you could trade uh, Mo Harkless, a cat filler, in their 2020 uh, first-round pick for for him potentially. Um, but I think right now, if you're the Clippers, you definitely need a center because if you're going to a playoff series, Zubach is definitely not the answer. Maybe as a backup guy getting 10, 15 minutes a night. But right now the Clippers are kind of, I think they're one move away from, I mean, you look at the roster right now, they, when Paul George and Kawhi Leonard play, they have the best pick and roll duo with Lou Williams and Montrez Harrell. Um, they have Pat Beverly. They have so many weapons on their team. I think they just need a center and a wing. And I think they might even be the favorites for the finals. Cause I mean, they have Kawhi Leonard and Paul George that could go and lock up Giannis coming out of the East. So I think a guy like maybe Tristan Thompson coming from the uh, Cavaliers, it's been reported that the Cavs want a first round pick for him, but I think Tristan Thompson's not going to be the biggest priority for teams. So I think, if you get closer to like Thursday morning, midday on Thursday, that you can maybe throw in a few seconds or one really good second for Tristan Thompson and then trade salary back. And then also one thing that Brian Windhorse was talking about is uh, the Clippers and maybe Andre Drummond as well. That'd be kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to talk about something. The, uh, list, I was listening to the Rigger NBA podcast on my way to school the other day. It's something interesting they mentioned. Paul George and Kawhi Leonard have only played 18 games together. Yeah, I think that's kind of insane. I mean, and they – a lot of these teams have taken about 20 games or so to kind of find their stride. Like you look at the Pacers and all these other teams. So, I mean, I do think they are easily championship contenders and they need that center presence besides Dubach. Like you said, Montrez, he isn't, he's getting out rebound a little bit. I do think Drummond would be interesting. I just think his price is too high for what they're asking. Detroit has obviously made it very clear. They want draft capital. They want picks if they're going to be doing anything. And that's just something LA doesn't have. I do think Tristan Thompson is something that could happen. I think that's a reasonable grab for LA. I think it's a great grab for them. It's exactly what they need. So I I think that'd be an interesting thing with LA. I mean, I do I think Tristan Thompson would be the only kind of move that I would see them make outside of Iguodala. If the Clippers can convince the Knicks to trade Marcus Morris, but it has been reported that the Knicks see Marcus Morris as a guy they'd like to keep and extend this summer because he's on that one year fifteen million dollar deal right now. But maybe the Clippers should go get Marvin Williams or Jake Crowder. I've I've seen Marvin Williams brought up in a lot of uh trip proposals up on twitter by some beat guys uh and then also jake crowder from memphis if memphis kind of like you said second hardest schedule for the rest of the season um jake crowder is one of those guys a plug and play guys that could impact any team so i think with any trade the clippers make you're throwing in mo harkless rodney magruder and then uh, either one of their second round picks or this 2020 first round pick so i think like we said the clippers definitely need help at center i think center more so than the wing it's just like Zubach, like we said, is a good pick and roll guy, but when he's off the floor and it's just Montrezl Harrell who is their primary backup center, it's just serves. It's very problematic, especially when we talk about against bigger teams. So I think the Clippers definitely need to get more size down low. Um, but yeah, kind of speaking of Andre Iguodala as well, the Rockets could also be another team to be in play for Iggy. But I think the Rockets will probably likely go get Rocco. Uh, Robert Covington has been reported by Woj and Kevin O'Connor the last 24 hours. So do you kind of just want to explain to the audience that whole trade, the four-team trade right there? So we'll look at that right here. So the basics of it, I mean, this isn't guaranteed yet. This is a proposed deal that they're all interested in. There's a lot of homes they have to go over. It's 
D'Angelo Russell would go to Minnesota finally after so many months of rumors. Covington would head to Houston. Clint Capel would go to Atlanta. And then a first-rounder from Minnesota would go to Golden State. Now, the things I don't get is Atlanta's like – it doesn't – I mean, I guess they're giving up draft capital here. They weren't really giving anything up, and they're getting Clint Capella, which is kind of incredible. And then I don't, I don't get why Houston – wants to move Capella so badly and just like, are you going to start in an A? Like PJ Tucker? Like that's, that is, puts you in so much worse of a position in my opinion to go there. They are already a team that runs short. James Harden's uh, visibly hurt. That Mike D'Antoni is running this team in the ground. And he, I, I think this is a terrible move, move for Houston if they were to trade Capella. I love Robert Covington. I just don't think a wing is what they need. They need center. I mean, they need a wing, but they, you're not giving up a center for sure for that. I, mean, I, I think that's kind of, ridiculous. I I don't think one first round pick is worth D'Angelo Russell. We've seen reports that they want to run Steph Curry and D'Angelo Russell and see if it works before they want to make anything. And now I'm seeing trades. I don't know which side is right in all of this. I mean, I think that's kind of always what happens with trade deadline. You hear conflicting reports everywhere. So I don't see how this trade really works. I feel like this greatly benefits Minnesota and it greatly benefits Atlanta and Houston and Golden State are kind of left out to dry a little bit. One thing the Rockets have kind of embraced is playing this small ball. I mean, we've seen the last two games on Friday night. They were the first team since I think the Knicks in 1963 to play an entire game with a player not listed higher, taller than six foot six. And it did so again on Sunday against the Pelicans before the Super Bowl, and I mean, you trade Capella, it's like, all right, well, what's your backup center? You have Tyson Chandler, who's I think just there for having a better presence in the locker room. Um, I think maybe a, a deal you could work out money, you could get Robert Covington, obviously, to Houston, and then maybe you could get Jordan Bell from uh, Minnesota also coming into Houston. He's kind of a 6'9", small ball center. You saw him play with the Warriors last year, so I think the Rockets right now are firing on all cylinders. Russ has kind of had his the best I mean, before the last two games, he had the best 15 uh, game stretch of his entire career, shooting 49%. Russell Westbrook finally stopped shooting three-pointers. Um, P.J. Tucker is getting healthy. Daniel House is shooting well from three. And then uh, Eric Gordon is, is uh, healthy again now and playing well. So I think right now the, the Rockets, I think one thing about Capella is he doesn't really fit into that D'Antoni uh, ISO offense. He kind of is just sitting there. I think they need more of maybe a stretch five or more of a, a roller threat to the rim that's like a smaller, undersized guy, like maybe a Jordan Bell type player. So I think with the Rockets team right now, I think you want to trade Capella. He has a pretty good contract. Uh, I think a team like the Celtics could also, also be interested in Capella. But I think if you're the Hawks, we've seen Trey Young complaining he wants to win. Um, I don't think they trade John Collins, but I, I still think. I think John Collins wants to play the four, but I think he's more like the positionless NBA now. I think he's more of a five. Uh, he has to improve that three-point shot. But I think a Capella and John Collins fit is a bit weird. But, I mean, if you're the Rockets, if you can get Robert Covington on that wing to get another defender, upgrade that over uh, Daniel House and get less minutes for Eric Gordon um, and get Eric Gordon more minutes at the two, then I think that's a win for you. But... I don't know. The whole Andre Godala thing is weird. The Robert Covington trade. So it's those two wings, I think, are the two biggest guys in the market right now. I kind of see the reason behind it, but I feel like if you go up against a team in the play, like the Lakers, like Anthony Davis is going to feast. Like there's nobody that's going to be able to defend him. If you somehow face the Sixers in the East, like and in the finals, like Embiid's going to feast. Jokic, like these are all guys that are just going to dominate because they have nobody that's going to be able to defend him, defend them that well. I mean, it's a glaring weakness. I mean, granted, Los Angeles, I mean, we kind of talk about that, but they at least have Zubac and Harold's okay. But I just, Nene and PJ Tucker, like that's just not going to get it done at all. Even if they get Jordan Bell, that's still not an answer for 20-plus minutes in the playoffs. I mean, he, he won finals with the Warriors, but he's not one of those guys who can play for over 20 minutes in a playoff series. So I think it's just – it's a weird – it's it's kind of weird what the Rockets want to do because they're trying to trade Capella and they want Robert Covington. It's like, all right, well, what's that backup option? They just don't have another backup option five, and I don't think they can go and play small ball through the entire playoffs. So it's just kind of – it's a weird situation right now. Um, another team that's linked to Capella as well is the Celtics. There's been reports that they are definitely interested. Um, Brian Winhurst did report that the Celtics won't be trading Gordon Hayward. Uh, I think if you're the Celtics and you can give, you can acquire Capella, or maybe they could get Tristan Thompson in a buyout, but more importantly, if you can acquire Capella without trading Marcus Smart, who has that $12 million, that's just like that 
perfect amount that's really easily tradable. You don't if you can get Capella without trading Marcus Smart, and I think the deal would be centered around Langford, Daniel Tice, and uh, Poirier, and maybe a first round pick. Uh, it's Memphis's first round pick, so it's not as sexy as it used to be. But I mean, if you can you know, uh, if you can get a deal done without giving up Marcus Smart or Gordon Hayward, I think that's a win for the Celtics. I'm biased against any of the Boston Celtics. Make I'm a Sixers fan, so I don't like Boston. But I mean, like you said, I think Capella would be a great option for them. A move they can make, move at Ennis Cantor or something. Their plethora of draft. Granted, the picks they have have kind of depreciated a little bit, but I mean, they just have so many of them to begin with. So I think it would be an interesting move. Capella, I think, would be a great fit for them, something they would need. Granted, go up against Embiid's and the Giannis's of, of, of the East. I think that, or a Bam out of bio. I, would, I think they can make a move. I mean, like you said, I mean, I feel like. I don't know. We keep hearing this fourteen trade. I just don't know if it works out. I think Capello, I think, could end up in Boston if he doesn't. If this trade doesn't happen to begin with, it seems if you're the Celtics, I don't think it'd be a straight up trade because if you're the Rockets, I mean, if if it was uh, the Celtics trading Langford, Tice, or maybe Canner, and then Poirier in that first round pick, that's not what Houston wants. There'd definitely be a third team involved. I think in getting another, maybe you throw those guys to Memphis in a Jay Crowder trade, or you throw them with Robert Covington again with. Uh, Minnesota. So I don't think it would be a straight up trade with Capella and the Celtics. Um, I think those are the two. I think the the Celtics and the Hawks are the two biggest teams for Capella right now. Um, and then I think another team as well that could do some stuff at the trade deadline is obviously we've we talked about the Lakers before, but the Lakers also need another another ball handler to lighten LeBron's load uh, as a ball handler. So they need just need a pick and roll score and a backup point guard because Alex Crusoe and uh, Quinn Cook are not ideal in the playoffs. As much as you love both of those guys, Crusoe and Cook as people, they're both really cool, good guys. Um, they're not backup options in the playoffs. So I think a guy like Derrick Rose could be headed to L.A. Um, I think if you're the Lakers, you want more of a point guard first, a backup point guard and ball handler more so than you need a guy like Andre Godala. And we've we've heard talks of uh, Darren Collison potentially making a return to the NBA. It's been reported that he wants to go to either LA team, either the Clippers or the Lakers. I think the Lakers need him much more than the Clippers do. So I think worst case scenario, the Lakers can't get anything done the trade deadline with maybe Derrick Rose. Uh, they can get Darren Collison as a backup option. Like you just kind of mentioned there, Darren Collison kind of seems like he's deciding between either the LA teams and then – like we kind of talked about a little bit, Bogdan Bogdanovich. There's that whole Kyle Kuzma Bogdanovich exchange we talked about. Los Angeles offered it. Sacramento turned it down. They think they can get more from their deal than Kyle Kuzma. So, I mean, I think that's something interesting to look for. I think they might try to make another offer, maybe throw some more. Now, I don't know what their draft pick situation is like. I, I mean, I know they, I don't know if they threw in any extras in the Anthony Davis. I knew they gave in their 2019 draft pick. But I think that'll be something interesting. Like we talked about before, Iguodala, I think that could be a possible thing. I think they're going to – or Davis Bertans is another one we've talked about. Like I think they're looking at a lot of the same targets that Philadelphia is looking at in terms of pick-and-roll scores, wing guys. I think you're going to see a lot of – they're both linked to a lot of names. I think Derrick Rose is another one we talked about. I think that's somebody they could be going after. I don't know if they have the, the capital to make a trade happen. So, I mean, there's a lot A lot of the guys we kind of talked about Philadelphia are kind of also linked with Los Angeles and Bogdanovich, Berton, Iguodala, Rose, a lot of those guys. So, I mean, I think they'll get one of them. They'll somehow figure – Rob Link will figure something out. They'll bring in one of those guys to help compete. Another issue with Los Angeles they need to help figure out – I mean, I think a guy that Iguodala can help with is they aren't really succeeding well against other – contenders like you saw about Philadelphia, Milwaukee, the Clippers, like they aren't they're struggling against other elite teams, but they seem to be running through these lower level teams with ease. So I think a guy like Igadala some experience in the locker room could help out with that. So I do expect to move. It's just weird, man. I I honestly have no idea what's gonna happen with Kyle Kuzma. I don't know what exactly his market is right now. I think he's obviously a bit overrated because he's playing for the Lakers. Um, I think there's a lot of guys that I would take over Kyle Kuzma. I think he's going to get paid way more than he's worth. Um, defensively, he's a liability. And despite him being known as like a good shooter, he doesn't shoot the best percentage from three. And he just hasn't really fit in well with LeBron and AD. He's kind of been that on and out coming off the bench. So I really just don't know what's going to happen with him. And I really don't see Vladi Divac trading the best young Serbian in the league in Bogdan Bogdanovich. They also have uh, Bailito as well, who's another Serbian. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I don't think if I'm Vladi, Bogdan's a, an uh, impending free agent this summer. Um, 
he's been linked to the Hornets, which I don't ever think that's going to happen because Mitch Kupchak says he's not going to acquire anything but draft picks and talented young players. Bogdan Bogdanovich is 27 years old and he have to get paid this offseason. So I don't think that works out. But yeah, I think the market for Kuzma and Bogdanovich is pretty interesting as well. You, you talked about Davis Bertans with the Wizards. And one thing that's been reported is the Wizards are buyers at the trade deadline. I mean, if you look at it, they're only three games out of that eight seed. And we've seen Bradley Beal. He's obviously upset that he's not an all-star. But you've seen his comments last week and throughout the season that he's really just mad that his team's losing. And the Wizards have tons of second-round picks. So I think... The Wizards being buyers, I think Berton stays. I think this the free agency this summer, I think one thing that's going into this deadline and then this summer as well is early bird rights on players are going to be really, really important because there's not that much talent out there. So if the Wizards had bird rights on a guy, on a guy like Berton's, I think that'd be important, but I don't think he's going to be worth more than $20 million a year. Uh, you have John Wall coming back. He's on that super max. But I think one thing that the Wizards can do is they have a lot of seconds. So let's say Tristan Thompson – kind of doesn't get a lot of attention and Cavaliers aren't getting a lot of talks and calls from him at the beginning. Maybe you could throw a few seconds for Tristan Thompson. Cause I think one thing right now, I was talking to a guy on Twitter last week about this is you have John Wall coming back next year. You have Bradley Beal, you have Rui Hachimura playing the combo forward spot, but you don't have a big guy inside. So I think Tristan Thompson, if you could trade a few second round picks for him, that'd be a steal for the Wizards. I think it's just interesting overall that they're buyers right now. It makes sense. They want to push for the playoffs. Um, I think they're 17 and 31 right now. So I think it's just interesting that the Wizards want to be buyers, but it makes sense if you're trying to please your superstar and Bradley Beal. Yeah, like I was about to say, I mean, I think they're trying to do anything they can to pre- please Bradley Beal. I mean, he's 28. He's been playing fantastic. The thing I just don't get, I don't think they'll help to succeed, is John Wall is going to be in his 30s coming off of a, a torn Achilles, which is an incredibly difficult injury to come off of, let alone in your 30s, and a player that relies a lot off of speed. I don't know if John Wall is really going to be the same player when he comes back. I don't know if they're going to be able to even contend or make a playoff spot if he were to come back. So I don't know. Uh, I mean, if you're trying to please him, there's really not much you can do. Tristan Thompson for seconds, if, it, if it's going to please Bradley Beal, I think it's a good investment to make. But I don't. They're really not going to have money to make a move for free agency. You're really going to be looking at draft capital. I don't know why you would move your what you have in draft picks if you were to give up a lot of it for a guy like Tristan Thompson. I don't see if that's the right move at all for Washington. I really think they should try to maybe. I don't. I think John Wall is probably when he's healthy the hardest contract that you can trade in the NBA just because solely how much he's making. He's like, it's not back. It's a super max contract. Like he's going to be coming back probably making around $40 million. So it's really just going to be difficult to move. It just sucks that he ruptures Achilles, right? I mean, John Wall's had a horrible last 12 months. His mom died and he ruptures Achilles uh, at his house. So I think it's just tough for him. And you pay him that money before he's injured. And before he was injured, he's one of the fastest guys in the league. One of the most explosive guys, um, point uh point assist double double machine so it's just it's weird i think the only reason why they would trade for thompson is just to please bradley beal and kind of try to get a winning culture in there uh thompson's been successful in the playoffs that's why he would be linked to the clippers as well um yeah, I think the Wizards, I was definitely very surprised when I heard the report that they were going to be buyers. Um, but another team as well as Miami Heat have been one of the biggest surprises of the whole year. I think Zach Lowe might have been one of the only guys that said they were going to be a top three seed. But one thing the, the Heat have not really been linked to, but let's say that David Griffin said Drew Holiday was, I know we already talked about Drew Holiday, but let's say the Pelicans were listening to Drew Holiday offers. I think if you're the Heat, you definitely have to throw in uh, Tyler Harrow, uh, Justice Winslow, and maybe one of those few first-round picks you have. But, I mean, if you're the Pelicans right now, it, the best time to sell is when nobody else is selling. And I think Drew Holiday potentially, with the Pelicans, their current situation right now, that they're not going to make the playoffs. This would be the perfect time to trade Drew Holiday with the time left on his contract. Because we've seen with other teams like Detroit, it – they waited way too long to trade Andre Drummond, uh, albeit that they were trying to get in the playoffs the last two years. But I think if you're the Pelicans right now, Zion's finally coming back. You trade Drew Holiday. You already have a bunch of good young guards. So you trade him to Miami, potentially. We've talked about Denver before, but I think Miami could be a team and play for him as well. Uh, the Heat have also been uh, – if Danilo Gallinari was uh, – available as well but he could also trade for him i think the salary work is weird with that i think you definitely throw in justice winslow um and some draft picks there but i think the heat like right now i think they're also kind of one move away they have bam out bio and jimmy butler who are both all-stars um chris nunn has literally been one of the most 
uh, one of the biggest breakout guys of the year up there with Devontae Graham. So I think the Heat are definitely interesting right now. They might just want to keep the ball rolling and kind of, I mean, if it's if it's not broke, you don't fix it. So I don't know, but the Heat could definitely be in play for Drew Holiday if he was made available. They've, like you said, they've been an incredible surprise. I mean, Kendrick Nunn, Goran Dragic, Tyler Harrow, Duncan Robinson, Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo is incredible development. They are very well-rounded and a very deep team coming in the playoffs. I do think they could try to make a move here, make something happen. I mean, Drew Holiday is interesting. I just don't know what that – I think of, they're looking at keeping Kendrick Nunn. I think they're going to look at keeping Harrow. I don't think you're going to see any of those guys moved unless it was for like a Bradley Beal or something. Bradley Beal can't get moved to the offseason. And this is like we talk about a trade of role play, off, uh, trade deadline of role players. So I like you said, Drew Holiday would be interesting. I think you would probably see a package probably around Dragic, Picks, and – I mean, like we've shown, Oklahoma City really just wants draft capital. I mean, they've got three picks for Westbrook, five, four or five picks for Paul George. So they're just racking up the draft picks they want. Look at a very Philadelphia-esque, but they're competing while doing it. It's, I don't know what they would be able to grab. I mean, I think they're a team that has – I think they're gonna see, you're going to see them as a lot more contenders in offseason trying to make moves in the trade deadline. They're looking at more bringing in another star, not role players. They kind of have a lot of role players already. I mean, the Heat are in a really good situation right now. I mean, Duncan Robinson is one of the best shooters in the NBA. We've already talked about Chris Nunn. So, I mean, it's kind of – I mean, it's a perfect place for Jimmy Butler to be right now. Bam Adebayo is already an all-star. He's kind of like a Draymond Green 2.0, a little bit more versatile than Draymond. So, I think the Heat are definitely interesting. But um, another team I want to talk about is the Oklahoma City Thunder. I mean, they could be spires if they wanted to or they could be sellers. What are your thoughts on them and what they could potentially do? I think you're going to see the Thunder as probably buyers. They real. I don't think you're going to see any of their draft picks getting moved, but if they can flip a couple of their guys for other possible players to help contend, I think you'll see that. I mean, Chris Paul, they look like Sam Presti and them look like they're trying to win, obviously. You haven't seen Chris Paul be moved yet. He's been talked about in possible trades by teams and fans being interested, but you really haven't heard anything from the organization about trying to move him. Daniel Gallinari's kind of been talked about a bit, but I think with Paul, Gilgis Alexander, Stephen Adams and the guys kind of been talking about getting moved. I do think I don't know if they're really going to be buyers. Like I don't really think I think they're kind of going to stay pat. I don't think I don't see them really making any moves at all. There's really nothing they can do. Like kind of like Miami, their moves are if anything would be in the off season. I don't see them making a, a role player type move. I think you're going to kind of just see them stay pat at the deadline. Yeah, I think one thing that the Thunder could do is we talked about before Danilo Gallinari. He could be moved because I mean when he's been out, they uh, haven't skipped a beat with him. And I think there are definitely some teams like Miami. Um, he's even been linked to the Sixers as well. Obviously, you got to take all these reports with a grain of salt because it's just a lot of time it's agents uh, hitting these to players to get their guys value up. Um, but Danilo Gallinari has been linked to Stephen Adams as well. He could be another guy at that could be up for grabs. I think the Celtics, if they miss out on Capella, they could go after Steven Adams. And, man, could you imagine that Celtics team right now? You have Kimba Walker, Marcus Smart, Jalen Brown, Gordon Hayward, Jason Tatum, and Steven Adams. That would be – man, that would be one hell of a team uh, in the East. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sixers fans, if that ever happens – I mean, Sixers fans shouldn't even be worried about the Celtics right now. They need to be worried about what's going on with their own team. Um with just Joel Ben. I mean, I think Ben's played well as a late, but I think Brett Brown's on his last leg, but that's a conversation for a different time. Um, but yeah, additionally, uh, moving on past the Thunder, um, Jack, talk about that potential trade for Kennard, uh, Luke Kennard going to Phoenix. Probably looking at raise. It was Elio Kobo, uh, Javon Carter, and a first round pick heading to uh, Detroit in exchange for Luke Kennard. I think that's, I think that's a steal. For, for Phoenix. I think that's a great move for the Celtics. That's a great placement right next to Rubio and Devin Booker. It's a shooter. It's something great. I think and what you're giving up for it, I think, isn't really bad at all. I don't know if Elio Kobo is really going to have much of a fit in Phoenix. Now, the, I don't know. What is the – was it a 2020 Phoenix pick? What was the pick, do you know, that was being talked about? Or did they just say first-round pick? They just said first-round pick. Now, depending on what that pick is, I don't know if I would give them – the well, actually, depending on where, where are they currently in the stands, they're probably in the middle of the pack. Depending on how they land, I would say maybe. I mean, it's a very top heavy draft, if any, really. I mean, it's really a top heavy, really isn't that heavy. They stand about 12th, they're about eight games out of last place in the West. I think it's a move. Kadar just a great player. I think it fits much better than whatever you would take at 11 or 12 or 8, wherever you would land. 
I think if it's a it's a some sort of I, I have a feeling it'd be some sort of protected pick, like a lottery protected twenty twenty or something like that. So I, I like it. I really do like this move for Phoenix. I think it's a steal of a trade. I don't know why Detroit's asking for a lottery pick for Derrick Rose and they move one of their young potential centerpieces for Eli Okobo and a lottery protected first. The Suns reported that when that whole report came out, the Suns said they, they could expect Luke Kennard to be a 30-plus minute per night guy. They could build around their core right now with Devin Booker, Kelly Oubre, DeAndre Ayton. They have Ty Jerome, Mikel Bridges. Ricky Rubio is on contract through 2021. They have Aaron Baines this year. Uh, they also have Cam Johnson from North Carolina. So, I mean, I think right now the, the Suns, I think, are a lot more confident in their team than – most people other around the league are. Um, I mean, they're not that good this year. I think Devin Booker should have been an all-star, but Aiton was suspended at the beginning of the year. Uh, Oubre has definitely made that jump this year. Rubio has been a perfect fit alongside Booker, who's who's finally has a point guard, a pass rush point guard alongside him. Um, I do think the Suns trade Dario Saric. He will be a free agent this year. Um, Philly's been linked to him. I'm not a big fan of Dario Saric. Never really was. I don't really think he's – I mean, against that Celtics in the 2018 playoffs, he just kept getting torched. Uh, but I think Dario Saric is definitely a guy that could be moved, $3.4 million. He's getting paid this year, expiring contract. A team could go after that. But, I mean, I think a team of Ricky Rubio, uh, Luke Kennard, Devin Booker, Kelly Oubre Jr., uh, DeAndre Ayton, Mikel Bridges, and Ty Drum, I think that's a – pretty good and cam johnson it's pretty good little uh young core you have there and then you have also uh jalen lequeu grinding in the g league uh i think that's definitely interesting um i don't know if see i don't think that's a steal for the suns um you're just trading a first round pick for canard he missed the last 22 games with um knee tendonitis he's definitely a good player with potential i think he would thrive being on a team with that actually has other good players on offense um I think Phoenix would be a good fit. I just you don't want to give up too much. Okobo has been a decent defensive guy since he's been in the league the last couple of years. Javon Carter has been okay. Um, that first round pick, I'd like to see if the trade actually happens. What that first round pick is, um, but it's definitely interesting. But another deal that came out last night, um, Ian Begley and Kevin O'Connor both reported that Julius Randall has been linked with the Hornets. Um, the Knicks are adamant about trading Randall. Um, the four guys mentioned in a potential trade uh, were Julius Randle, Dennis Smith Jr., Terry Rozier, and Malik Monk. The money actually worked straight up to trade Monk and Rozier to New York for Julius Randle and Dennis Smith. Uh, it's one thing that Rob Boone, who's a, uh, who works for the Athletic covering the Hornets, he said that it was just the Knicks and the Hornets doing their due diligence, seeing if God was available. But, I mean, if you're the Hornets, you've seen the rise of Devontae Graham this year. Uh, the fit long term with Terry. I mean, Terry's been w- well in his role off ball this year, but long term, you have Terry Rozier and Devonta Graham is probably not the best, if, especially defensively. So if you trade for a guy like Julius Randle, who's a power forward, who has one less year on his contract, uh, I think that would be good in that sense. But if you're trading Terry and Malik straight up for Julius and Dennis Smith, you kind of the Knicks kind or the Hornets kind of go into a Knicks situation where they have a bunch of power forwards. Um, they would have Miles Bridges, PJ Washington, who both already right now are having trouble with that fit. And then you also throw Julius Randle in there, who's not a center. That's kind of just a weird fit there. I'd say if you're trading for Julius Randle, you throw Miles Bridges in that trade. But if I'm the Hornets, I'm not trying to get Dennis Smith back because he hasn't shown he's been good in the NBA since he's been there. Neil Kina hasn't really been promising either. So you're not really getting anything back in return. If you're trading Terry, I wouldn't trade Monk with him. Um, I think Monk would do what, let's say you trade Terry. I think Monk would do well in that starting role with an increased role, but uh, I'm not a fan of that deal. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Not being a guy that covers the team without a little bit of a bias. I, I tweeted this out earlier. It's na- name a better duo, Charlotte and Bray contracts. I don't, I think this is just a move. I don't, see fit for either team. I mean, like you talked about Rozier, but I think you could find a better trade partner for Rozier that fits Charlotte better. I don't know if Julius Randle and Dennis Smith Jr. is what is best for your roster. I don't know. And I I like Malik Mock. I think he's going to be a, okay in this league, but I just don't know if moving Rozier – I don't think it's just a right tra- – I feel like they're just making trades for the sake of making trade here. I just don't think – it's worth it. I don't think it's a move that should be done, and I don't really see how it would benefit either team. Both of these teams really aren't looking to compete. Grand, like you talk about, Randall has a year less on his contract, but like you said, I think you can get better fits for your team from if you're going to even move Terry Rozier than Julius Randall and uh, Dennis Smith Jr. 
What's good is there's no legitimacy behind that trade. Thank goodness Rod Boone got word on that because I think a lot of Hornets fans that are already upset right now would be absolutely more upset because, I mean, Terry's played well this year, but if you're going to give up, I'd be fine like swapping Terry and Julius just for a year less on the contract. But I think I wouldn't be fine with it but because you'd have that lock jam at power forward. But it just shows that the front office, if – they were actually entertaining ideas for Rozier. It shows that long-term, they don't think that's a good long-term fit. What's good for the Hornets is once Rozier's contract is up, you'd imagine that they'd be kind of getting out of their rebuilding stage and they'd be trying to push for or maybe a late seed in the playoffs uh, with that salary cap filled. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't see a deal like that happening. I don't, it's not going to happen, thank goodness. But it was definitely interesting that that report came out. But another guy, speaking of the Hornets, is Marvin Williams. He's a vet that's a 3 and D guy that can kind of uh, – pick and plug into any team, the Clippers, Rockets, Philadelphia, um, the Lakers, any any team that needs a forward could get value Marvin Williams. Um, the Hornets will probably want a late first or a good second round pick and a young player for him. But I think Marvin Williams is one of those guys. Uh, he's shooting the three ball well. He's a really good veteran presence. He's a great guy in the locker room. Uh, he rebounds the ball well, and he's been played at small ball five at times. So I think for a lot of contending teams, Marvin Williams could also be a good guy. I mean, like you said, I think it's, Somebody interesting. I really don't know much about Marvin Williams. I think you're way better suited for the situation. He's 34, I think you said he is, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I do think he's somebody a possible trade ship. I don't know if he, I think you could see him get moved for a small piece, but I don't know if he's really going to be one of the main moving points in the trade deadline this year. But I, I think he's an interesting guy. He's a solid four. So, it something could happen. I don't know. Like I think you're way you're way more knowledge of the situation going down, Charlotte. If something were to happen, so I don't really know. I really don't t- know to be honest with you. He's definitely the guy that get, most likely get traded on the Hornets. Um, I think him and then maybe Bismack Biombo if a team wants a uh, center that can play ten or fifteen minutes. Um, I mean, I think if you want salary to work, if you're in a Roco trade and you're trading Capella, uh, Biz could maybe potentially go in that trade as well. Uh, he's kind of been out of the rotation recently with Billy Hernan Gomez getting that playing time. Um, yeah, but I think Marvin Williams, he's definitely the most likely guy to get traded from the Hornets, but I don't think the Hornets are going to do anything at the trade deadline. They'll finally be able to be a salary dump team next year. They get $45 million off the books. Um, but staying in the East – uh, the Toronto Raptors have also been a big surprise team this year. Um, they're on pace right now to win 59 games. So that team last year with Kawhi Leonard, they won 58 games. So, I mean, even when Pascal Siakam was missing time, Kyle Lowry, who's an all-star, who's averaging 27 and a half and four and a half this year, uh, stepped up and they didn't really miss a beat when Siakam was gone. Um, if they could potentially make a win now move, that would be huge. I do you think Toronto, I think that's very interesting. See, I mean, I don't know who they would really – even go after, to be honest with you. I, like you said, I think it's interesting to see my um, Sayu Jiri is kind of linked to New York. I don't know if that's – do you think that might stunt any moves they might make at the trade deadline with all of that going on? I don't think Masai is going to go to New York. The one report we saw from Woj is the Knicks are going to try to model after that Lakers and Warriors kind of front office structure of getting a guy that used to be an agent into their into their front office. So I don't think – I mean, you have to give up uh, first-round picks to get Masai's back. So I don't think they're really going to give up anything. Yeah, it's definitely interesting with Masai in that front office. I think he stays put in Toronto because, I mean, right now he has – win now potential and also has potential for the future. You obviously have to pay uh, Van Vliet this summer, but I think right now for the Raptors, if, even if you don't make a move, um, you're going to be a top four team in the East. But if they make one move, I'm not really sure who it would be for. Maybe some more depth on the wing. Uh, Norman Powell's hurt for the next, I think, four to six weeks. He fractured a bone in his hand. Maybe get another guard um, or more depth on the wing. I think that would e- propel them even more. I t- We kind of talked about before, I think – Maybe Tor- Toronto would be interesting for Andre Drummond, kind of. I think that could be a possibility. I mean, with Marcus Allen, I don't know if that would be the right fit, but I think that would be a, a team that could maybe have the capital get done if they wanted to put themselves over the edge to compete. I don't know who – I mean, we. I mean, I know you did kind of talk about it. It did kind of come out that Marcus Morris, the organization having a different uh, idea of mine than Steve Mills has made Marcus Morris available – that everybody can go. They really aren't really holding anybody back besides RJ Barrett, it seems. And Kevin Knox has been thrown around in trade talks. So I do think Marcus Morris could get moved. Toronto would be an interesting spot to see Marcus Morris. I don't know if they would make that move. But, I mean, I think that's something that could be interesting to see. 
I think that would kind of be the one guy I would maybe link to Toronto, somebody that could land there. I think also the buyout market this year obviously isn't going to be as hefty as it was last year and years past. Um, I think if you're a if you're on the buyout market, you definitely look at Toronto. Obviously, you're going to look at the Clippers or Lakers first. Um, but yeah, I mean Toronto, it's just so surprising. Um, I mean, it's really not a surprise. Their player development structure is one of the best in the entire NBA. Um, they just continue to win and. Guys just keep rising up. Pascal Siakam. We have Chris Boucher, who's the MVP of the G League last year. So they've definitely been a surprising team. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we were talking about the Knicks. Uh, let's talk about what happened today with Steve Mills. Uh, he supposedly got fired, but he got fired, but he didn't get fired. It's pretty funny. So, basically, in the press release, it said, um, it is anticipated that Steve Mills uh, will be nominated to the board of the standalone sports company following the completion of his proposed spinoff, the entertainment business, pending all necessary approvals, including by the MSG board. So basically, he got fired as president of basketball operations, but he's still going to have a role for the Knicks. That's just a very weird and a very Knicks situation. Yeah, it's just the low Knicks. I mean, like they, they were talking about bringing in a possible agent, like you see seen with Golden State and... Los Angeles. I don't know who they would bring in. Rich Paul, GM, 2020. <laughs> but I, don't, I mean, I don't know what. I don't feel if. I mean, as long as James Dolan's the owner, I don't know if anything's going to get done because I feel like he's he doesn't seem like a GM that's willing to go into luxury tax at all. I don't think he's really willing to make moves that would be necessary by an owner to help make the team competitive. Besides, throw money at Masai Ujiri. And I don't know if, like you kind of talk about, I don't know if Masai would leave Toronto unless he's giving him an ungodly amount of money and he's saying, listen, I'll step back from all basketball stuff. You can take over. You can dip into the luxury tax to make this team competitive. Because, I mean, you talk about owners making money, but a team that makes more money than the Knicks is a successful New York Knicks team. A successful team in New York would be bringing ungodly amounts of money to the city. I think he has to realize that maybe start making those moves necessary. Steve Mills, I don't think was the right guy for the job, but I don't know if anybody in New York is the right person. Job. I think they really need a whole clean sweep of everything. They kind of did it. They kind of got rid of Fizdale. They got rid of Mills. Dolan needs to have a complete change of mindset for them to make that next step to try to compete. This is a next franchise that really it's been competitive in small spurts. They were competitive in 2010 with Melo and Studemeyer and everybody. And then they were competitive Back in with Ewing and Starks and all of them, like in the nineties before that was Willis Reed. Like they've really haven't had legitimate success since the seventies. I mean, the mid the eight the nineties Knicks was successful, but they didn't bring him a title. Yeah, it's just I mean, a lot of organizations it kinda of, it starts at the top, uh, with your owner and James Dolan has continued to just not be I mean, just be incompetent. I mean, <laughs> all those uh all those fire Dolan chance or sell the team chance that happened in Madison square garden uh, last week that have happened since Dolan's been the owner. Um, he found one random teenager yelling, sell the team and kicked him out of the arena. It's just, man, it's just Dolan. Dolan's got to figure himself out. He's got to get over himself, but I do think they're making the right steps now because I think if you're a team right now with the Knicks, um, you need to start at the top. So get a guy that can run the team first, make the right moves, not have seven power forwards on your roster. It makes absolutely no sense. Um, actually hit on draft picks. Neil Aquino wasn't, wasn't a hit. Uh, the relationship with uh, Porzingis um, went haywire, and then they traded him to Dallas. Uh, and they just, I mean, they just haven't been able to hit on anything. They haven't been able to get free agents. So hopefully they bring in an actual GM. We've seen it um, with a bunch of teams. The Bucks have a good GM. Um and just a bunch of guys out west. So it's it all kind of starts in your front office. But as an owner, you kind of have to be vulnerable and you have to be open to criticism, which Dolan seems narcissistic narcissistic and is not. So it's, man, it's just a weird situation with the Knicks. Um, anything else, trade deadline stuff you want to talk about? Derrick Rose was interested. We kind of touched on him everywhere. I mean, I think we kind of got everything. I mean, I'm, it's going to be a very – I have a feeling no, there's no way any podcast put out is going to stay relevant for more than an hour. Probably by the time we put this up there, I guarantee you it'll be a trade or something that's just going to make this whole thing irrelevant. That's just how the way it goes. About. I feel like free agency and trade deadline, it's going to be a hectic time no matter if it's – I mean, it's – I'm big in the basketball, but obviously we have a podcast, so I mean all the role trades I feel like are big to me. But I mean to a casual fan, they're like, who cares? But I, I think it's going to be an exciting trade deadline. I'm really excited to see what goes on. 
honestly, like you said before, it's kind of for the NBA nerds, the guys that cover teams. It's all the little moves because, I mean, that's what makes championship teams. It's, I mean, obviously these big moves happen, but a lot of times you see these big moves like last year, Philly getting Jimmy Butler and Tobias Harris. They didn't make it out of the second round. So a lot of those big moves don't really propel teams up and kind of know the landscape of what's going to happen this year. So, I mean – Right now, it's going to be all those little moves. So I think there's going to be a lot of little stuff. Nothing big is going to happen. It's going to be a lot of small little moves happen. And, yeah, I mean, I honestly, starting tomorrow, Wednesday, stuff's going to start heating up. And we've seen stuff start to heat up today. Uh, more reports are going to come out. But I think tomorrow, like in 24 hours from now, uh, there's definitely going to be a whole lot of influx of trade. So I'm super excited. I'm not going to sleep a lot. I'm just going to stay on my phone uh, just in case those 3, uh, 3 a.m. trades happen. I don't I, – I, for some reason, I've always – I don't know if it's just because my phone's a vibrate, the vibration wakes me up. I have woken up at least an hour after the, the ridiculous midnight madness trades. I remember I was up at four in the morning and I saw the Tobias Harris trade. And I'm like, well, I couldn't fall back asleep. I was just checking my phone for hours. I woke up at, I think it was what, like 4.30 in the morning to the Kawhi Paul George dudes. And like, I could fall asleep because like the entire NBA changed. It's I I've, I hope I don't get wake up I hope I don't get wake up at four o'clock in the morning or something ridiculous this time but if you don't, it's that it's that time of year it'll be interesting to see yeah I mean when the uh, when the Tobias Harris trade broke last year um, I remember just waking up I woke up all my roommates because I just started screaming uh, just because I was just man I was still at the time covering uh, Sixers and I just was so I mean I, you didn't no one saw this this coming. Um, I mean, we, we kind of thought that Tobias would be traded just because he's an expiring contract and the Clippers were kind of uh, looking to just get a bunch of picks and young talent. And, man, I woke up. I just remember waking up and screaming and woke up to my roommates, and they were like – they thought something – like they thought I got hurt or something happened to me. But, yeah, it's it's trade season. But, man, I'd probably get a similar reaction to uh, – um, to the Spice Harris last year, if Drew Holiday got traded, or if a Kevin, I mean, ever, we kind of expect Kevin Love, but man, if Drew Hall, I mean, it hasn't been like legitimately reported, but it's been reported that he'd be that teams like the Nuggets, the Heat, teams like that would be interested in Drew Holiday. So a trade like that would be absolutely insane. So it's definitely, um, we've heard a lot of reports about teams, but their true colors are definitely going to shine here in the next 72 hours. Oh, yeah. It will be exciting to see. I think you're going to start to see contenders fill themselves out. And then you got the entire buyout market. Coming up after that, which will be more exciting. It'll be interesting to see going forward. So, I mean, these next couple of weeks are going to be probably the most exciting time in the NBA until playoffs. Oh, definitely, 100%. Um, so, as we wrap this up, do you have anything you're working on right now that you're about to post on TPL or anything like that? Um, I mean, I'm working on um, doing my whole big entire fleshed out history of the process going on. I've kind of got – I'm trying to take it season by season. So, the 2012, I'm starting the 2012-2013 season – um, waiting. We're still working on that. We should. We're actually going to be to an opposed position coming up on the 2012 2013 season. We're kind of going to be. It's going to be special episodes, kind of talking about each season. On this, it's going to be more of a Sixers oriented post position. It's, and we're going to be talking kind of about each season, what was happening as that going on, kind of as a sister project to the series that's coming on. So I'll be working on that. I mean, you're going to. We are probably going to be coming up on this. I mean, I'll talk about it more Thursday. We'll be back. We're going to be talking about all the trade man that's going on. We're going to have Jason Blevins will be joining us, talking about whatever Sixers move, if or doesn't happen, kind of talking about that. So you'll be hearing from us shortly. I mean, what do you got working on, Jack? Anything? I mean, right now I'm going to do the Hornets um, got Ray Spalding. So I'm going to do a piece on him. I talked to him last week. So I'll probably get that up in the next few days. And then honestly, just trade deadline stuff. Um, I mean, we get into all-star break, we get a little bit of a break, but a bunch of Hornets are in the all-star weekend with Miles Bridges, PJ Washington, and Devontae Graham and the Rising Stars Challenge. And then Devontae is also in the three-point challenge that was announced today. I uh, did a piece on that. Uh, talked about J- James Brego's rotation yesterday. He spoke about that a lot last night. So honestly, not anything huge. I'm working on just normal Hornets beat stuff. So um, working into that trade deadline, and then I'll definitely have stuff after that if the Hornets do anything. Or if they don't. <laughs> I mean, and as always, guys, be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Post Position Pod or individuals at Jack Duffy TPL, at Jack Connell TPL. I mean, you follow us on Tapan Lines as we've talked about numerous times. Be sure on Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave five stars and review. And we'll hear from you guys later. <laughs>